pleasure having you on board. stands for Abusive bona fide Contradictors. Yes, and then we went through Absent Bulldust Commentators. And then we ended up being Apathetic Bureaucratic Cartel. And then we've become Avoiding Blubbering Conjectures. So I'd like to remind you all of my most famous slanderous quotes He's not a journalist, he's a misogynist. And I'm so glad that I'm called up here and other people that have all been so supportive in slandering him. Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad I well deserve this award. Thank you. Here is your mother. separate comb and hair gel because I do feel that he's spending more time on his hair and that's a real image I didn't actually do that to his hair um, yeah more time on his hair than he does caring about his constituents his people yeah you need to hold that too darling oh there we go thank you thank you we had a board that's that's good and you ask why did we pick Boris to to be awarded the Muppet Cup well He's the butcher of Ukraine! Yes. yes, he's a bit of a butcher. He's a pretty boy butcher. So he did basically nothing. He's a bona fide baboon. He did nothing for Assange. He did his very best to keep his hands clean while he had them fondling in the taxpayer pockets of the UK citizens. Millions of pounds. Millions of pounds they were charged to attack one man, one lonely man. Imagine the healthcare, the education, 
It could have changed a nation, but no, they needed to swing their big muppets around and create a stir. So tonight, Boris is being awarded two muppet cups. Yay! <laughs> a bedazzled one for Boris himself, and now uh, a special crystal and 24 karat gold for his hair, a separate entity in and of itself. <laughs> Okay, everyone, thank you so much for being here. There's some great speakers coming up who will be talking about the freedom of the press. How did an Australian citizen yes. be charged with crimes effectively questioning their loyalty to a foreign state? Yeah. How did that ever happen? And why did our government abandon him? Yes. It's absolutely wrong what happened. What he did was expose the crimes, expose war crimes that happened in many different places. One of the reasons I became involved in politics in the first place and involved in libertarian politics was because of wars. And if we think about the Iraq war, we were drawn into that war based on a lie. Yep. Yes. Lie, lie about weapons of mass destruction. We found out it was a lie. So many of these lies, and the people that lie and commit the crimes don't get punished but the people that expose the lies get punished. Yeah, this is yeah, wrong. Yeah. We have to be ever vigilant to defend freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, all of these other freedoms. We have to remain ever vigilant because we know that the government, when given the opportunity, they will take them away, they will lie to you, and those that speak the truth will become the victims of the government. Yes. But I'll, I'll try not to get too heavy. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to everyone that's campaigned for so many years on this. I'm absolutely certain that it went for far longer than anyone anticipated. But the goal of getting Julian home back on Australian soil has been achieved and all of you did it. Thanks very much, David. Our next speaker now is going to be a lovely man. He's, he's from the Citizens Party. He's actually one of the founding members. So let's give a big hand for Craig Isherwood, who is going to, he's going to tell us everything. And he's going to expose the bastards who have kept us in the dark for years. Come on, Craig. Come on, do it. Well, thanks very much for having us and having me here today. I'm actually here because of the thousands of people within our party, just like you, who wanted to, uh, me to come along and express how happy they are that we had a victory, that we got him out. And I think we've experienced for 36 years, I founded the party 36 years, the ABC is the biggest bunch of creeps we've ever come across. And I can go through chapter and verse what that's about. I can go through so much over those 36 years. But what Julian represents, is this idea of justice, of integrity, and all the things we haven't had with a lot of our political party leaders, not all, but most political party leaders in this country for a long, long time. So our party members want to say, g'day, I hope that, and they'll be saying to you, I hope you've had as much fun, even though it's a serious business, that we did. Now, I'm so glad that we're here tonight, instead of in that damn place outside the damn British Embassy, protesting. And I'm even happier, this might sound weird, about last week, Rain said, can you please print me a thousand flyers? So we printed a thousand flyers, colour, back and front, A4s. And the next day, we heard that Julian was free. And we chucked a lot. That's the best, that's the best use of flyers I've ever had. You want to talk about mass distribution? Do it. Our next speaker is Antoinette Latouf, who, as we all know, has been attacked by our money. 
The ABC is ours, so they say. We own the ABC, so they say. But the reality of it is the ABC is owned by foreign interests. These are not our people anymore. We've got to wrestle back the ABC, we've got to wrestle back our government, and let's listen to the wonderful, beautiful Antoinette. Thank you. a different event than what I'd signed up to a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Initially we were all coming together to yes, celebrate in a way Julian's 53rd birthday. How many people in this room thought we'd be celebrating his release as well? No! Yeah! Oh there's one! Oh it's good to have one optimist in the room. Uh, for those who don't know me, I shot to international fame for being sacked. That's a strange thing to put on my CV. Uh, but after sharing a human rights watch post about Gaza and starvation being used as a tool of war, my employment with the ABC came to an end and it is now the subject of two court cases. Um, and what's been revealed subsequently is uh, two very active WhatsApp groups, Lawyers for Israel and Jewish creatives and academics who sought to get me out of the building and it seemed that they had success. They've got the power. And I think a lot of people, it's really interesting and I can't speak for Julie, I can only speak for myself to say that as journalists and publishers and editors, we're in the business of telling stories and it's really strange when you become the story because we don't set out to become the story or I know I certainly didn't set out to become a poster girl for press freedom or a poster girl for human rights but somehow you sometimes find yourself in this circumstance. Often Julian has been described as brave, um, I've been described as brave and I want to unpack what it is to be brave because the, the technical definition is to you know, to go ahead and do something, to be courageous, even though you know that there can be consequences. And I, don't know, I guess for me, it's like knowing 7,000% it's gonna hurt, but doing it anyway, because it's more important that your pain isn't as important as what it sheds light on. And I guess that's where we found ourselves in, in 2024, that it's become brave to talk about human rights? Like, what, what, where did we go wrong? That it's become brave to care about journalists being killed? It's become brave to say, hey, I don't think starving children to death is okay. I think we live in a bit of a dystopian world where that is considered brave, when standing up and saying that that is not okay is somehow a form of bravery. I also think the word bravery has been cheapened. When Ben Robert Smith was given the Victoria Cross, and so I just think that we need to reclaim what it means to be brave. Ben Robert Smith isn't brave, and I don't think me saying, hey, let's not starve Palestinians to death should be brave. Something has shifted, the equilibrium is wrong, and it's really, and, it, and it, it, that's what keeps me up at night. I don't want to be called brave, I certainly don't want Ben Robert Smith to be called brave, and I, I, I just think we can't take our institutions like the media for granted and the important role it plays. I was really hardened to see the photograph of Julian hugging Stella. I think everybody was moved by that. But then I was also very swiftly disheartened to think how many years did it take? How many years did it take for Julian to get his freedom? And a lot of my media peers have spent a lot of time going, Oh, but is he technically a journalist? He didn't go to journalism school. He was a publisher. Did he follow? Did he follow journalism code of ethics? If we're to apply, if we are to apply, did a journalist apply the journalism code of ethics? Ethics. Ethics. Then, how much of what Murdoch Media puts out follows the journalism code of ethics? If that is our litmus test of what is considered a journalist and what is in the public interest, then there are serious questions to be asked about the rest of the media. In terms of who is brave, and I want to take the label of, of brave journalist away from me, 109 Palestinian journalists have been killed. They turn up every day knowing that they're sharing truth to the world, 
they're bypassing traditional media, getting stories. Many don't make it to the end of the day. They are brave. 109 have been killed, the most amount of journalists killed in a single conflict since the Committee to Protect Journalists formed in 1992. 50 have been arrested, others have gone missing. That is bravery. That is the sort of fearless journalism that we need. Not those sitting writing op-eds about, about Assange and about public interest and how much public interest and you know whether or not publishing is journalism. I'm like, we need to take, we need to look at what the sacrifices journalists in Gaza have made. We also need to look at the deafening silence amongst journalists in the media here who don't seem to be up in arms about the fact that 110 of their peers have been killed. Yeah. Don't seem to be too concerned. Do they know their names? Where are the memorials? Where are the hashtags? Yeah. Yeah. And so Today we celebrate Assange, and I think that's an enormous win, but we have to continue to fight for the freedoms and basic human rights that we know are being stripped of Palestinians every day for the past 75 years. A lot of people also say to me, why would you want to go back and work at the ABC? Um, I believe a fair, robust, representative, public broadcaster is worth fighting for. It is yes. ours. Yes. It is essential in a democracy. And it, it shouldn't bow to political pressure. It shouldn't bow to lobby groups. It needs to tell our stories. It needs to be impartial and independent. It needs to speak truth to power without any fear or any favour. And so that is why I am continuing my case. And that is why I hope to be back on the airways. People sound crazy. People are like, why would you go back there? If we all get bullied into silence, I don't think our democracy prospers. Um, and so I'm honoured to be here tonight to celebrate Assange's return home, but also to remember who the real heroes are and to remember the bravery of journalists in Gaza. Thank you very much, Antoine. Our next speaker is probably familiar to you all. Uh, it's uh, an incredible man. Um, I've known him for, I don't know, I can't really say, he's in front of Paul later on, but probably 55 years or something like that. And, um, you know, a lifelong friend. Uh, he introduced me to his son some 15 years ago when he was set out on this vision of, of telling the truth. For, for God's sake, that's all he's ever done is tell the truth. And what a crime, you know. I mean, we've been smacked all our lives for some things. We've been hidden in the dark for others, but telling the truth, that's what he did. And that's what he set out to do. And, and, and John, as I said, I've known John for about 50 odd years, and uh, I've met Julian a couple of times. And now he's free, it's a wonderful time. And John has gone through this amazing journey of week in, week out, getting on and off planes, talking all the time, he's pulling stuff to his ear, sitting on planes, he's a six foot something bloke, with his knees up around his chest, flying to all God knows where to talk to people, you know, and it's a little, you know, we've all done something, or else Julian wouldn't be free, we've all done something, everyone in this room has done something, and yeah, <laughs> But what John has done, and what hopefully we'd all do for our child, you know? Hopefully that's the, you know, the, the maternal, paternal instinct. But the reality of it is he went on beyond that. And it, he has lost a lot. He's lost his home. He's lost time with his children. He's lost time with his friends. Uh, he's been pillar to post, he's, you know, his health. You know, he keeps talking about my health, you know, but I mean, I think his health is a little bit worse than mine. Although I drink, I'm a bit sort of a heavier on the drink than that. Anyway, John, where are you? You had your, yeah, you said he was going for a pee. Hey, John. Thank you, John.
the rules. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, That's a first. <laughs> Um, I'd like to sort of do a couple of things, just a, a bit of a finale. In essence, I'd like to just run through a little bit of a poem, only two verses, it's short, don't worry. <laughs> As you set out for Ithaca, hope your journey is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lystragonians, Cyclops, Wild Poseidon. Don't be afraid of them. You won't find things like that on your way. As long as you keep your thoughts held high. As long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lystragonians, Cyclops, Angry Poseidon. You won't encounter things like that unless you bring them along inside your soul. Unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your journey is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when with what pleasure, what joy you sail in the harbour scene for the first time. May you visit many Phoenician trading stations to buy, to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, ebony and amber. May you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and learn again from those who know. I'll, I'll leave the rest, but that gives you some idea that it's a journey that we all have been on. And now, we take sensual perfumes of every kind we celebrate. Next, what it is, now all of us, except for a few brothers that I see here, of all of us are from somewhere else. We all come here. We all come from somewhere else and gathered together under the name of an Australian, or Australians. What characterises an Australian? A few things. We are all ascend from the dirt. We are men and women of the dirt. We don't have aristocrats, although we have people who ponce around the places where they are. That's forgivable, it's just the play of life. Vincent Lingari and Gough Whitlam. Gough Whitlam poured dirt into Vincent Lingari's hand. Lingari and Gough are men in the pantheon, pantheon of Australians. Vincent Lingari's house had a dirt floor and yet he caused and changed a substantial part of Australia. I want to celebrate. I want us to reverence those men and women. That's important because they are our ancestors and we rest on the shoulders of our ancestors. I want to praise here and wonder why. I want to praise here John Pilger. Undoubtedly, John was the greatest documentary maker of his generation. Without a doubt, no competition. Heads and shoulders up there. Not mentioned in our parliament. No state funeral. But what's wrong with these people that a slight offence of criticism and they become vindictive and turn their back? I mean, if we were like that at home, and somebody said to me, you know, well, John, you're a bit deficient in this deal. You ought to look more closely at what you do before you do it. I walk out the door and shut it, never come back. It's ridiculous. John Pilger.
Wilfred Burchard. Yes. Yo. Another great Australian, never mentioned. He was the first journo, or reporter better said, first reporter to report on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the catastrophe of that bomb drop. He also reported on the attempt by the Americans to, it was UN actually, but the principally United States, to destroy North Korea. The Curtis LeMay, in charge of the Air Force at the time, said to the other generals, look, I've bombed everything twice. There's not a stone upon a stone left in North Korea. We only know that through Wilfred. What it is to be an Oz. We must reverence these people, otherwise we are cast adrift without ancestors, without a substantial body of culture to rest our hearts on. Important. Julian Assange, another one whose freedom tonight we celebrate here. <laughs> Now I begin to draw together the other thread of this conversation with you, our discussion tonight. What brought about Julian Assange's freedom? Us. You and me. You generically, me generically. All of us. It was a, the, a phenomenon that was extraordinary to be involved in to watch an incoming tide rise to a king tide and then become a tsunami. And that tsunami propelled the Parliament of Australia to make a motion to the United States, the mighty United States, who were fearful of. They stood up. Antoinette Latouf mentioned that she is involved in setting up something which will examine what it is to be brave. Well, it certainly is of our parliament to say to the United States, we want this lad brought home. Then a delegation goes from Australia to the, the United States Congress and says, look, fellas, this is our citizen. It needs organising. Get to work. The, the Prime Minister, the Stephen Smith, the High Commissioner, Kevin Rudd, began weaving the necessary diplomatic web to bring Julian home. We don't know the inner and out of it, but we can speak to ex-diplomats and they'll give us a clue here and there. The Parliament also, the members of the parliament also went and saw Caroline Kennedy, who's the US ambassador in Australia, and said to her, look, we want Julian brought home. This, these parliamentarians and politicians are part of us. They only act that way because of the upwelling of feeling from us. 20 previous foreign minister, I've got to tell you this, it's a hoot. The, pre the previous foreign minister, Maurice Payne, got 24,000 <laughs> emails from Assange supporters. That's more than one, you know, 24,000 repeated to her over and over again, so much so that the parliament, I believe, I'm told, changed its methodology if an email has the same title or similar title <laughs> then uh, after five that goes into into an archive so our so change your email titles so our computer wallet invented a method to have 35,000 different titles Now, to have that sort of intellect on your side is a winner. Yeah. Yes. 
and he's not the only one. There are dozens of us. They're all here tonight. You represent those people. Another thread to join with the others. This is the final. AUKUS and the Northwest Shelf. Australia exports more gas, natural gas, than Qatar. Qatar gets $29 billion for that gas each year. Australia gets $800 million. So wrong. So wrong. I reckon that's a task for us to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. You can thank Alexander Downer for that. Alexander Downer was High Commissioner for London. Oh, a friend of ours, Kieran O'Reilly, put the button oh. holding in the street outside Harrods and said, you know, what are you going to do about Julian Assange? He replied, oh, nothing. He's an Ecuadorian citizen now, not our responsibility. Asshole! Dennis Halliday... We're in jail! And Hans von Sponnick. Where you belong? They were third in charge of the United Nations. They're friends of, you know, they're supporters. Dennis, in a delivery to the United Nations... Uh, I can't remember the date, forgive me. But it was some years ago. In a delivery to the United Nations said that it's very unusual to find a man in such a high station of life so stupid. <laughs> the last thing, and these are Australian things, and they're responsibilities that fall upon our shoulders. We've seen there's a possibility with the Assange campaign to change things. The last one, AUKUS. We pay $368 billion to rent four submarines and build eight. The Russians, the Yazin class, is equal to the Virginia class, only slightly better. It has better acoustics. They build eight for nine billion dollars. Yeah. Contemplate that for a minute. We've already lost. Yeah. It's not possible to expend that sort of money to defend yourself when our given competition, I don't know why we're in competition with Russia, but they say we are. I mean, I, I actually like Russia, but I wear this hat to sort of symbolize the protest against you know, them, them choosing our enemies for us. The same as James made a comment about China. What do I want to fight China for? Weird. Anyway, um, submarines are a platform for weapons. The Russians have hypersonic missiles on their submarines. We have cruise missiles. They're obsolete. So we have a double indemnity. We've lost in both directions. It's now become a responsibility of Australians to assist the Prime Minister to get this albatross yes. off our necks. Yes. We assist yes. the Prime Minister. We do not resist or curse. We assist these parliamentarians. And I the clouds which dictum. It is fair to judge an event by its results, for it's the soundest criteria. That applies to the Assange campaign. I'll repeat it again. It's fair to judge an event by its results, for it is the soundest criteria. Yes. Congratulations. One more thing. It's really embarrassing 
when you see Trump and Biden <laughs> quarreling at each other. And I think to myself, these old fellas, they don't know when to shut up. <laughs> As I was the same age, this will be the last. So thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Can I just say, I don't think it'll be last to see John Shipton. I think we should meet John Shipton in Parliament, or at least in the Senate. Let's, let's get this man in the Senate. Let's get, let's get this country moving. Let's move along. Let's become who we are. Australia is a powerful country and a powerful part of the world. And we're peace-loving. We don't have to have enemies. We don't need alliances with not cases, you know? We, we, can, we, can, we can work it out. We can, when the Chinese already own the place, then it's already worried about them for, you know? If you couldn't hear that, uh, it'd be really nice for everyone to come to the front. John really wants to get a quote over there. Uh, hello, everybody. Look, we want a group photo, so come up a bit close. Um, not, not on the stage, I'll come down. Come up. And then take a photo and you can send it to your grandkids. <laughs> so, thank you.